you may be dismissed. I had a wonderful time with the Sunday school class this morning. We got to go to McDonald's, amen. <laughs> and uh, they, every once in a while, I'll treat them. They're so good downstairs. They're so eager to learn. And uh, we, were, we were in the van, and they're asking uh, all the different Bible questions about creation we've been learning the past several weeks. And they're, they're remembering. They're, they retain and remember more than I can nowadays. And uh, had a wonderful time, and, and uh, so praise the Lord. Thank you, parents, for letting them come. And so next week we'll uh, get back into it, uh, and uh, though they're looking forward to it. Well, if you have your Bibles, then Genesis chapter 12, that's where we are right now. Genesis in chapter 12, 13, 14, been in there the last few weeks. And uh, today, if we go back to chapter 12 and begin to read in verse 4, Genesis in 12 and verse 4. Hallelujah. Back at the book of the beginnings. Beginnings here. And very, very, uh, the word of God speak to our heart. I pray the Lord would speak to us today. That you'd open your heart to Him. And let the Holy Spirit do a great work and a deep work into your life. That's what we want. Uh, I think that you, you would agree with me that there's so much surface Christianity today. That I believe it's going to burn up. I, I do. I, we're going to talk about that in Wednesday night. About the... The wood, the hay, the stubble versus the gold, the bronze, the silver, things like that. And uh, the other things, wood, hay, and stubble burn up. Uh, but when they're tested by fire, uh, gold just gets purer. Amen. And uh, so, but with this, uh, I, I want to minister this morning. Uh, in verse, begin to read in verse 4. Are you there? Amen. And so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were then in the land. And then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Aon east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. I'd like to minister this morning on this thought, Abram's journey of faith. I want to talk about Abram's journey of faith. And I think sometimes you read this and, and we really don't put a whole lot of thought into how challenging this was or difficult it is or the journey that we have before us. Where we're saved, we sometimes get the idea everything's going to be uh, easy going. There's not going to be any problems. A smooth sailing, if you will. Calm seas. But you'll find that it's not that way in this Christian life. God, God didn't say that it would be calm seas. But I do know the one that can calm the sea. I know the one that can uh, speak to my heart, the one that can lead and guide my every step for the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I know that I'm saved and set free. I know that that uh, my life, uh, even though I'm saved now, but there's coming a time when I'm going to be in the presence of God for eternity. And it's hardships, difficulties on this life, but one day I'm going to be with Jesus in heaven and there's not going to be any more problems there. I want you to know that. Everything's maybe a mess down here, but there's no mess in heaven. God's in control. I want you to know that. But I want to talk about this journey. I want God to speak to your heart. I want you to open your heart to understand and think about this journey. Are you willing to take it? Are you willing to do what God's asking of you to do? Are you willing, when God speaks to you, are you willing to step out by faith? Or are you going to say, well, I'm just going to let somebody else do that. I'm going to let somebody else take care of that. But are you willing? If God says if He wants you to step and leave out of the land of Ur, are you really willing to go? (laughs) Are you willing to do what God is asking of us? And so I want to talk about this journey of faith today. Let us pray. Father, God, I, I thank You with all my heart for Your grace and Your goodness. I love You, Lord. I, I praise You. I thank You for the grace of God. I thank You for the call of God. I thank You for what You're revealing in these pages as we're studying the life of Abraham. 
I, I pray, God, that you'd open our hearts today, that we just not hear a word and go home and nothing's changed. But, God, we'd, this, root, this word would take root in our hearts. God, I, I know that I cannot do this without you. I, I thank you once again for the opportunity to minister, but I, I pray, God, for the anointing. I pray for the unction of the Spirit of the Lord. I, I pray, God, for inspiration. The Lord Jesus to come and to visit us here in the preaching of this text, which, Lord, I believe is most important today and right now. God, I come against all distraction. Oh, lead us by your precious Spirit. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, last week we had dealt with Abraham's call that came from God. We look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, and it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I'll show you. And we know that Abraham was from Ur, of the Chaldees, and they were a people that were devoted to a moon god by the name of Nanar. And he was raised and steeped into idolatry and idol worship. And a pagan society, if you will. And Abraham didn't know the true God and had nothing in himself to deserve knowing God. But God graciously called Abraham. Now Hebrews 11 and 8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now the life of Abraham is an example to every one of us who want to walk by faith. Abraham obeyed God when he didn't know where or how or when or why he should go. But he believed God in His Word and he went forward. He did. He went as God called him. Now, what does faith do? That's a good question. Because we can talk about having faith and I've preached many messages about faith from this pulpit through the years. But what does faith do? Well, very simply, this is what it does. It simply obeys God. That's it. I mean, that, that is it right there. Faith will obey God. That Word tells us what we ought to be. That Word tells us what we should be doing, what we ought to be doing. Amen. Faith steps out and does what God says to do. That's faith in its simplest form, if you will. It does what God says. Back in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, not very easy to do this. God calling me into the ministry. I fought with that. I difficulties with that because of my age. But nevertheless, I, I had this burning call in my heart that would not release me. That I had to follow God and what He was telling me to do. But then when God called us up to Bluffton, Ohio, that it's another step. Are you willing to, to sell out? Are you willing to sell everything you have? Amen. Are you willing to leave your family? I want you to know that wasn't easy. I, I mean, a family got upset with me, got angry with me. Are you taking them grandbabies? I take her daughter, that's one thing. But you take them grandbabies, that's another thing. That, you, that opposition, that difficulty at that time. Are you still willing to follow God? I didn't have a job in Bluffton. I didn't have one. I'm going to be a youth pastor. All they can pay is for the rent of that house. $450 a month. That's it. I'm leaving a job that's paying me $21 an hour back in the 90s. Now, that, there's a good job. I've got security there. I've got, you know, I've got the career. I've got the insurance. I've got everything. Well, I leave there. I have no insurance. I want you to know. Insurance stops. So I said, I resign. I'm leaving that place. What are you going to do about insurance? That's what people would say to me. Well, what are you going to do about a job? I said, I don't know. No. I said, I just know that God's called me and He'll make a way. I know somehow, some way, that God is going to help us to do. Amen. If God called us out of here, then God will provide for us. Well, you could say a lot of the what ifs, and I could have stayed down in Baton Rouge. I could have done nothing. Amen. But, but, but I've got to follow God. What does faith do? It obeys God. Faith does what God says, even if you don't understand why. It believes God. It trusts God. It keeps on walking with God, even when times get difficult. That's right. Faith presses on. I heard one preacher say that great faith must be tested greatly. That's right. Great faith must be tested greatly. There are times that you're going to endure great trials in your life. Amen. Well, you say, Pastor, I don't want that. Well, then you don't want to go where God's going to take you. I said, you don't want to go. You're going to stop right there and God can't do much for you. You can come to church and play your little religious game that God says, I've got a place to bring you. There's a land over there. There's something. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to help you. But you've got to be willing to press on to where I'm leading you to go, even if you don't understand. Peter said, not to think it's strange concerning 
the fiery trials that's the trials or some strange thing has happened to you. First Peter 4 and 12. Oh, yes, sir. Trials come to all of us. Well, you might wonder. You might ask the question, why is this happening to me in my life right now? Have I done something wrong? Is there sin in my life? Is God angry at me? Has He turned His face away from me? Well, my friend, it might not be any of these things. The fact just might be that God is testing your faith just so, so that you might have Great faith. Because genuine faith is faith that has to be tested. You see, you don't know what you have unless you've been tested. See, Abraham and Sarah were not perfect. They made some unfortunate mistakes. They went down to Egypt when things got tough. But God never told them to go down there. They got ahead of God and in the flesh when they're trying to help God to fulfill His promise and ended up with an Ishmael. We're still suffering from those consequences of today. Listen to me, my friend. God doesn't need your help. He needs your obedience. He doesn't need you to help. He, he, he knows what He's doing. He can fulfill that promise. But what He wants of you is your obedience to Him. Hallelujah. Are you willing to obey? In fact, we're all suffering. Amen. From the fall in the garden that was made about 6,000 years ago. Sin affects all of us. And we're currently living in a sin-cursed world. But Abraham and Sarah walk was generally characterized by faith and faithfulness. When they sinned, they suffered for it. And the Lord was always ready to forgive when they repented of that sin. Now, someone said this, that the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. Hallelujah. As you study the life of Abraham, you'll learn what faith is and how to walk by it. You'll discover that when you trust God, that no test is impossible and no failure is permanent. Hallelujah. Amen. And I thank God for the blood. I said, thank God for the blood. Now, folks, let's, 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 faith, let's focus on this. Faith is not based on feelings. Although the emotions are certainly involved, we are people of emotion. I mean, we feel something. We laugh. We cry. We hurt. We sense. We feel. But faith doesn't live by emotions. You've got to get this. No, no. It doesn't live. Faith doesn't live by emotions. We live by the Word of God. Hey, what you got in your hand, that is the Word of God. And that's what we live by. If I live by emotions, I wouldn't be in this pulpit today. I'd have taken that opportunity and moved down to Texas when my parents offered to buy me a house when I was sick. You see, but faith, I said, I can't go. Why can't you go? I said, God won't release me. But you're sick. I know I'm sick. Well, you don't know what's going to happen. I know I don't know what's going to happen. Well, what are you going to do? Well, what I've been doing all this time, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God. And I can't go down there. And as God tells me to go, listen to me, I'd rather stay in Marion, Ohio, preaching behind this pulpit in front of 60 or 70 people and be sick in body than to be healthy and out of the will of God. Hallelujah. I said there's a difference. I'd rather be in the will of God and be sick in body than to be healthy in body and out of the will of God somewhere where He didn't call me to be. I said it's not based on feelings. It's based on the Word of God. It's written, Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Oh, yes, sir. It's not by feelings. You see, at times you may not feel like worshiping, but you worship. At times you don't feel like coming to the house of God, but you come. At times you may not feel like praying, but you pray. We do these things because we know that this is what the Word of God tells us to do. Faith walks in obedience. It doesn't say that faith works according to our feelings. Faith doesn't work as dead. It's true. See, true faith. It's based on the Word of God. God told Noah, build an ark because it's going to flood the earth. Judgment's coming. What did Noah do? He built an ark. <laughs> Amen. We, hey, man, well, you know, there it is. Just read the Bible. There he is. He built an ark. It wasn't easy. He toiled. He labored. He worked. I'm sure there were some days that Noah woke up and he said, I don't feel like working on that ark. But faith builds on anyway. Understand that if Noah didn't build that ark, they'd all would have swept away in that flood. There wouldn't be a one alive on the face of this earth. But Noah had to get up. Maybe his bones are aching. Muscles are hurt. Whatever. I'm, what are you going to do today, Papa? I'm going to do what I've been doing and God told me to do. I'm going to get up and build that ark. Well, Papa, you can take a day off. You can do something else. No, sir. God told me the floods are coming. Judgment's on its way. I'm going to build that ark. I'm going to preach that word. 
God spoke to Abram, Abraham and told him that he, what he would do for him and through him if he would trust and obey God. And someone said, great lives are trained by great promises. And this was true of Abraham and Sarah because God's covenant gave them the faith and the strength that they needed for their long life's journey. Now listen, we're not saved by making promises to God. We're saved by believing God's promises to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're saved by believing those promises. It was God who graciously made a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham responded to that covenant by faith and obedience. Faith responds. My friend, how you respond to God's promises will determine what God will do in your life. I said doubt doesn't respond, but faith takes a hold of what God says. Listen, the Bible records God's many covenants, beginning with the promise of the Redeemer in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And it culminates with a new covenant through the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, the word covenant in the Hebrew language has several meanings. Number one, the word covenant means this. It means to eat with, which suggests a fellowship and an agreement. Secondly, the word covenant means to bind or to fetter, which means a commitment. And thirdly, the word covenant in the Hebrew means to a lot, which suggests a sharing, if you will. You see, when God makes a covenant, He enters into an agreement to commit Himself to give what He promises. It's purely an act of grace. It's an act of grace. You see, God didn't give Abraham a reason or an explanation. He simply gave him a promise. God said, notice this. He said, I will show you. Then he says, I will make of you. And then God said, I will bless you. And then he says, I'll bless them that bless you. Genesis 12, 1 through 2. See, God promised to show Abraham something. He promised to show him a land, make him into a great nation, and use that nation to bless a world. God blesses us that we might be a blessing to others. And his great concern is that this whole world might be saved. Amen. That's what God's interested in. He's not interested in you driving that a hundred thousand dollar car or owning 15 homes or, or even getting a bigger paycheck. I said, God will provide. But that's not what He's interested in. I said, He is interested in souls to be saved for the kingdom of Almighty God. Souls. All those who are of Abraham are blessed because, because the promise that went to Him goes to all those who are born again and washed in the blood. Oh, yes, sir. You see, Galatians and 3... Chapter 3, verse 7 says, Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. If you're of the faith, if you're born again, then right now you are a son of Abraham. And the Scriptures, notice this, says, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles. That's you and I. We're the Gentiles. Either you're Jew or Gentile. He's talking to us. God's speaking something to Abraham so that several thousand years later, you and I might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and get saved and be washed in the blood of Christ. So therefore, the blessing comes to us. He said that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, not by feelings, not by emotions, by faith. Then it says, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. In you. You see, in that word Gentile, I'm in that nation. I'm that Gentile, and I'm in that nation. Understand? So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. I'm blessed today because I'm of the faith of Abraham. Abraham had to believe God. It's accounted to him as righteous. Why? Because he believed the Word of God. It's the same for you and I. We must believe in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that died for us at Calvary. Believing upon that sacrifice. I am redeemed. I'm saved and forgiven. And now the blessing lives inside of me. You see, the problem is we take the blessing and we lower it down to the standard of the material. And see, we don't understand the Scriptures right here. And we say, oh, God bless me. And it's always the material. Wait a minute. I've got the blessing right here. See, the promise, amen, to Abraham is that promise that's in me right now. Jesus Christ is that promise. He is that seed. Understand. And that blessing's inside of me. I tell you, folks, every time somebody asks you, how you doing? Wherever you are, you tell them, I'm blessed. 
What do you mean I'm blessed? I'm of the faith of Abraham. What do you mean by that? The promise that was preached to him and made to him is the promise that now dwells inside my heart. I said I'm born again. I'm a blessed people. But you're sick, but I'm blessed. But you got the flu, but I'm blessed. But you're ailing, but I'm blessed. But you don't feel good, but I'm blessed. But you don't have much money. I said, but I'm blessed. I said, I'm blessed today because the promise lives inside of me. You didn't say you go by your feelings or emotions. I'm blessed. See, we've got to get a hold of this. The, the reason why we're up and down, up and down, up and down. I left you Sunday. You're in a good mood. I saw you on Tuesday. You're grumpy. <laughs> you didn't make it Wednesday. You're late on Sunday. <laughs> what happened to you? So you're living by your feelings. You're not living by the blessing that was promised to Abraham, which you now have inside of you because you have the same faith as Abraham. You must believe by faith and it's accounted unto you as righteous. Hallelujah. That blessing's inside of me. So now I'm not going to live by what I, by my feelings or my emotions. I'm going to live by what I know. I'm going to live by what I know. And I know that Bible says that I am of the faith as the same as Abraham. And that blessing lives inside of me. And so therefore, what does that conclude? It concludes I am one blessed person today. We, we, I know what we do. We look at the natural. We look at things that happen to us. And, and we, we feel sorry for them. Say, wait a minute. I'm a blessed person today. To be absent of the body, to be present with the Lord. This is not my world. I'm just passing through. I'm a stranger here, folks. I know I'm a stranger here. You know, we was in McDonald's this morning. And uh, I had nine children plus myself. That's ten of us. I tell you what, everybody, everybody's eyes are looking like this. I mean... <laughs> One person asked me, with all them years, no, 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 they're not mine. <laughs> That's the, I said, my Sunday school class, no, no. I, you know, I put my wife through that much. I said, no, it's, it's, it's all right. <laughs> I said, we're, we're, we're a Sunday school class, you know. So we went at, you go in there and you get your food and you come to, we get to the first area to the right there, over there by the uh, Walmart over there. And I thought, oh, this is an opportunity now. There's people sitting around there. Some people trying to, trying to ignore that we're there. You know, they want their privacy. They want to be all quiet. Well, your kids are very good, by the way. And I said, kids, I said, let's bless the food today. <laughs> and so I stood up in the middle of all that, and I just began to pray. Hallelujah. I tell you, there's an opportunity there. I said, we're, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your son. Thank you we're born again. Thank you for blessing us. We need your presence in this place right now. I mean, God, right there. An opportunity. Everybody can look around. It's kind of what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on. We brought church into that place this morning. <laughs> We brought that blessing with us here this morning. Amen. Now, now, first steps of faith are not always giant steps. Listen, in the beginning, Abraham obeyed God, but he didn't fully obey God. Instead of leaving his family as he was commanded, Abraham took his father, and he also took his nephew Lot with him when he left Ur. And then he stayed in Haran until his father died. Now, Haran was about six to 800 miles north northwest of Ur, as far as what I can see in the Bible maps. There's a great truth in this. Whatever you bring with you from the old life into the new one is likely to create problems with you. I want you to know that. Whatever you bring from the old life with you into the new life is going to create problems. Terah, which was Abraham's father, kept Abraham from fulfilling, from fully obeying God. And Lot created serious, serious problems for Abraham when they finally had to agree to go their separate ways. Abraham and Sarah went down to Egypt when there's a famine, but God never told them to go down there. Now listen, folks. The life of faith demands total separation from what is evil and total devotion to that which is holy. That's what faith is. The Bible tells us abstain from the very appearance of evil. We are to abhor evil. In other words, detest it. That means what is sin, what is sinful, what is evil. We are to hate it. We are to despise it and revolt against it. Now, the problem with most of the church and Christianity today is that we've compromised so much to now we tolerate what is worldly, unclean, and we tolerate what is evil. In fact, we've tolerated it so much that we can't even discern the difference anymore. We don't know where the line of demarcation is anymore between what is evil and what is holy. We don't know what's holy and what's evil. And we don't know what's God and what isn't God. Jeremiah 15 and 19. If you take out the precious from the vile, you shall be as my mouth. God brought you out of sin. He brought you out of darkness. He brought you out of a uh, uh, sin-sick world. Amen. And consecrated you for His glory. Amen. And now you can talk and speak what God tells you to speak. We must take that out of the vial. We, we, we cry evil for what's holy. 
For instance, we say that prayer and fasting is legalism. We say that obedience is legalism. No, sir. It's called a walk in the Holy Ghost. It's not legalism. It's faith. I said it's faith. And it used to be that way for the church years ago. Now, Thomas Fuller, a 17th century Puritan preacher, once said this, that all mankind was divided into three classes. He said, he said the mankind... Three classes. Number one, the intenders. Number two, the endeavorers. And number three, the performers. You see, Abraham's father, Terah, may have been an intender, but he never made it into the land of promise. Lot was an endeavor up to a point, but he failed miserably to walk by faith. But Abraham and Sarah were performers. Why? Because they trusted God to perform what He promised. Oh, hallelujah. Let's go to Romans. Romans this morning in chapter 4. Look with me in verse 18. Romans in chapter 4 and verse 18. It says this. Verse 18. For who contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he's about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what He has has promised, He was also able to perform. He believed. My body's a hundred years old. Sarah's old. How's this going to happen? But it said that Abraham, he didn't waver, but he continued to believe in the promise that God had given to him. Given to him. Understand, there's no way this is going to happen in the natural. But he believed God to perform that promise and what she said. Now, folks, we have a tendency to believe God as long as it looks like it's possible in the natural. See, but that's not faith. I said, that's not faith. If you could see it, that's not faith. You, you have to believe what His Word says. God speaks to you, your heart. It looks impossible. There's no way this is going to happen. But you believe God anyway. You trust Him. You hold on to that Word. God giving you a promise. Something's going to happen. You hold on to that. You know it's God. Devil tried to take it out of you. Circumstances try to take you out of you. Doubt, unbelief tries to take it out of you. But you believe God by faith. Listen to me. If you're a hundred years old and God says you're going to have a baby, you hold on to that promise. <laughs> Hallelujah. If God tells you to do something, well, I've only, something great. Well, I've only got 50, 60 people in the church. How is that possible? I didn't say you look at them people. I said, you look to me by faith. God said, you trust me. See, David got in trouble when he counted all the fighting men that he had in Israel. He took a census. God said, you don't take a census. No, no, you look to me. Your strength, your might, your power, it's not in man's ability. It's not in numbers. It's in Christ. It's in God. It's in the Lord. He is your strength. He is your might. He is your power. Power. You see, when you got to be careful with this because you you tell somebody what God told you to do, and if it's not the right one, they're going to go, "Well, well, sister, well, brother, ha, uh, well, uh, well, I don't know about that. Let's see if we can't figure another way out." Wait a minute, God spoke to you. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe the Lord. You, you go up to Bluffton. <laughs> you don't have a job. And people at Exxon so gracious. They got me a big cake, ice cream, envelope. They took up $300-something dollars to help us with our moving expenses. <laughs> There's another message in that. but <laughs> I wasn't getting a whole lot from the church, but I sure got a lot from those around me. <laughs> but... Um, I didn't get anything from family. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing from family. You know, God says, listen, listen, Mark, I'm your provider. Uh, amen. God, God, God can even touch those that are lost to support those that are saved. <laughs> and then, but you don't have a job. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to trust the Lord. You get up there. I tried. I tried working at Sears. I couldn't make it on $130 a week plus four fifty. It's going down quick. That three hundred dollars doesn't last that long. <laughs> so I walk into Cooper Tire. I put my resume in there. And they said, Well, you know, we don't have 
that position. We don't have what, what you're asking for here, design engineering. It's not really, we don't have that available. A month later, they call me. said they've opened up a new job. They've never had this before, but they're going to split the task of, of this particular job into two different categories. And we'd like to interview you. So I go and interview with them. We had a good interview. Had wonderful. They asked the question. They said, why? Why did you move from Baton Rouge up to Bluffton, Ohio? Why did you do that? Well, I knew it was coming. I knew it was going to come sooner or later. I said, well, this is what it is. I said, I, I, I said God called me in the ministry. I went to Bible college. And I said, I'm up here. I'm a youth pastor in this church down here in Bluffton. That's why I'm here. So he called me to do that. And uh, I just need a job to help me out here. And, uh, well, they apparently liked that answer, whatever it was. They, they called me back. They hired me. Well, folks, I'm, God taught me a valuable lesson. Amen. God will open that door. That no man can shut. You understand? There, there wasn't a job there. But the Holy Ghost goes before me and He creates a job. Amen. He told somebody, you need to split this job up into two categories. There's a young man down there in Bluffton, a youth pastor, stepped out by faith. Hallelujah. And he needs a job. Hallelujah. They, they call me. Well, I had, you know, they called me and told me I got the job. Well, hallelujah. They asked me, how much do you want? I said, well, I'm scratching my head. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll uh, just, you know, just pay the bills. Uh, I'm getting four fifty a month. I said, how about, uh, uh, you know, I was making good money at 40 something thousand. 45,000, whatever, at, uh, at Exxon. And I said, well, how about 30,000? Is that okay? I said, is that too much? And then he said, well, he said, that's, that's a good start. He said, well, how about 36? I said, 36 sounds good to me. I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the folks, and, and, and then by the time you got all the benefits and the time I was there for three years and you get all the, you know, I was making about 50,000 a year. I mean, everything, you get, you know, you get benefits and things like that there and uh, bonuses and all that. Wonderful. I mean, praise God. I said, provided. I was able to tithe more, able to bless the church. I didn't, I didn't have to ask the church. I bought all the supplies. I bought the cleaning supplies to clean the church. I bought the cookies and the crackers. And I'm saying, you have to do that, but God blessed me, so I did it. You understand? I just did it. Praise God for that. Well, then I got attached to that job, and there come a time when we had half of what we have in here, if even that. And God says, it's time to let go of this one. And now you're going to have to trust me by faith. I said, wait a minute. I am trusting you by faith. No, you're holding on to this job. And so I said, well, I told, my, I told you know, uh, I said, well, okay, well, I, I'm thinking there's going to be time to go. I gotta, I, I'm thinking, okay, this is about January. I said, well, how about, uh, oh, June or July, I'll just let go of this job. And uh, so I, I kind of, you know, just, you know, thought it that way. I'll just let go of it in. You know, God, you know, deal with my heart. I just, you know, no way we've got enough people to support the church. Me as a family, no way we're going to do it. $100 a week is all I'm drawing in as, as, as income from the church. That's not my primary source. God says you're holding on to that thing too much. You've got to let go. So let go. It's no way possible. I didn't say you look at the circumstances. I didn't say you act by feelings. You do what I've called you. Folks, I hem hauled around on that. Oh. I told my wife, I said, God, I think God's telling me to let go of this job. Well, my wife, you know, she's just kind of cut and dry. Well, if he's telling you to do it, then do it. I need a little bit more support like that. I don't need that kind of support. Said, work with me on this, honey. I mean, just, <laughs> you know, work with me on this. I don't know. What do you think? It might not be God. I was hoping she'd say, no, that's not God. And confirm my thoughts. And I'd just be on with that. But she didn't do that. She said, oh, it's God to do it. I said, I don't know if I can do that. Kind of getting used to this job. Got a cozy nest. Look, things are looking good. I mean, honey, I mean, we brought in fifty, fifty-one thousand dollars last year. God's blessing us. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, praise God. Well, March came around. I think it was March. And, uh, my boss that I had, he, he left. He became the CEO of the bank, uh, in Upper Sandusky, the one we have our mortgage through the church. God worked that out too. That's another step of faith. But, uh, he left. And so now I don't really have him to help me because he really, Helped me in the ministry. You know, he was he had favor with him. And uh, the big boss, he brought me in his office. He said, this is what I want you to do, Mark. He said, things are going to change around here. He said, I'm going to need to send you to all these different plants. I want you to survey. You've had survey experience. Yes, sir. He said, I want you to go to all these plants. I said, I can't do that. I said, I got, I got a church. I pastor a church now. When I started this job, I was youth pastor. Now the whole thing's on my shoulders. I can't leave like that. Five days out of the week, I got my family. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you've got a few choices. Number one, take that job. Secondly, take another job within Cooper. Thirdly, get another job outside of Cooper. My three choices. Well, i tell you what. I thought, well, I'll think about it. Well, I him all around that and waited and waited. And, you know, finally they brought me in. They said, tell you what. I'm holding on to this nest. I like this nest. He said, tell you what. You found, he said, you found you a job yet? I said, no, I hadn't found one yet. Got one inside of Cooper. No, I don't have one. Not outside of Cooper. No, he said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you 30 days and you're done. Whoo! 30 days. That's in March. I'm done. 
30 days. You got 30 days. I said, it's all over now. <laughs> I come home and told my wife. I said, I guess I got 30 days and it's all done. God said, you're holding on to this too much. I am your provider. Amen. I came before Cooper Tire, and I'll be there after it's gone. I want you to know. Amen. I'm talking about faith. Sometimes we look at the circumstances. We're looking at the dollar. We're looking at the checkbook. But we're not solely dependent upon God. Well, folks, March came along 30 days later, and I had to say goodbye. God did something in my heart. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe Him by faith. And I've been here ever since. Hallelujah. It seems God caused you to step across that Red Sea. And Moses will say, stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. He'll call you to step across that Jordan River. He'll call you to do something. You don't look at the circumstance. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, the one that provides for you. you know, they, Abraham and Sarah committed their lives and futures to God. Obeyed what he commanded, received all that God planned for them. Now, what lessons can we learn about Abraham's journey of faith? Number one, faith brings us out. Now, remember this. Faith brings us out. Genesis 12, 4 and 5. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old and departed from Haran. And then Abram took Sarah as wife, Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered. And the people whom they acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Now, it's possible that it might have been his son's love for his aged father that delayed Abraham. But the day finally came when he and Sarah had to leave Haran and go to the land that God had chosen for them. And faith and, and, and a double mind never go together. And you cannot serve two masters. Faith demands commitment. Understand, it demands commitment. Sometimes I get the impression that commitment is a vanishing commodity in today's church. I mean, you don't want to be committed in our jobs or the marriage vows or one another. The essence of today's mindset is I'm going to do it my things, my way. And this attitude has invaded the church. Many believers will not commit themselves to ministry in the church. Or they, if they do, many times it's with a half-hearted commitment or enthusiasm. We're living in a time that you have to beg and plead for people to help in ministry. Nobody wants to get involved. Believers move from church to church with a window-shopping attitude. Jesus said the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. See, we'll put 110% into that job, but we'll put 40% in the ministry of the church. See, our, 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 see we, our priorities are wrong. See, we think that job is more important than that ministry. Well, I, I, I think the other way around, you see. I know it's important, and you ought to be responsible. And you ought to do your job and do it good, do it right under the glory of God. But that ministry is very important. I had nine children's hearts today that I want to teach in the ways of God before that world rips them to pieces. Amen. It shouldn't be that we're afraid of that world, but that world ought to be afraid of us. And I'm hoping to raise up out of this church these young children, men and women of God, that know the Lord, that are filled with the Holy Ghost, and don't know just about that Word. They have become that Word. That Word's in their heart. They go out there. They know those Scriptures. They know God, that world, that devil, that, that Antichrist system isn't going to persuade them. Is it going to make them doubt or rethink what they know? They know that they know. They've experienced Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. That ministry. Whatever God puts to your hand is important. We put it at a different level these days. It ought to be at a high priority in your life. One minister said it's a day of fading declarations. Church covenants are found in the backs of hymn books, but they have faded in the lives of most members, if they ever meant anything at all. Declarations of purpose, personal dedication grow dim and need to be renewed. It's a day of faded declarations. Where would we be today if Abraham and Sarah had not committed themselves to obey God by faith? Where would we be if previous generations of saints of God had not fully given themselves to the Lord and sacrificed themselves unto God? Amen. We who have come along later must not take for granted the things that previous generations paid a great price to attain. If Jesus Jesus tarries, may the next generation that looks back at us and say they were faithful. And when, amen, and when we enter into the portals of glory, may Jesus say to you and I, well done, my good and faithful servant. See, by 
you not come into the house of God, you're teaching your children that it's okay not to be committed. By, by not living a holy life, you're teaching your children it's okay not to be committed. By, by watching things, you're teaching your children it's okay to not be committed. Yeah, they'll grow up and they'll do the same thing if not worse. Why? Because mom and daddy did it. Mom and daddy did it. If mom and daddy did it, that should be okay with me. No, 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 no. No, you look to that word. You look to that word. We are to be committed. Understand. Hey, that's who we are. Number one, faith brings us out. Secondly, know that faith brings us in. Genesis 12 and 6 says, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. He said, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Now understand this. Get this thought. God brings us out that He might bring us in. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 23 says this. Then He brought us out from there, that's the land of Egypt, that He might bring us in to give us the land of which He swore to our fathers. There it is. Understand. Deuteronomy 6 and 23. He brought us out that He might bring us in. We don't know anything about the long journey that Abraham and Sarah took from Haran to Canaan. But when they arrived, they were strangers and pilgrims in the midst of a pagan society. Understand that Canaan is a picture of the believer claiming their inheritance of faith. See, understand that some say that Canaan is heaven. No, no. It's not heaven because there's going to be no enemies in heaven. You see, God had appointed a Canaan to every single child of God. It's obtained through faith. We must take hold of that which God has for you and I. He gives it to us, but we also must take hold of it by faith. God had given it to Abraham, but at the same time, Abraham had to step out, that's right, by faith, and receive that which God had for him. See, understand, and, and this is what I'm seeing today, there's a difference between knowing something and obtaining something. You, you, there's a difference between knowing and obtaining. Your head may be filled with knowledge, but it hasn't become a reality to you. It's not enough just to know what you must take a hold of it. You must step out. You have to obtain it by faith. Amen. Not enough just to hear God say something. You've got to step out by faith and do what He's telling you to do. You can talk about the promised land all you want. You can even look at it from a distance. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Look at the green grass. Look at the hills. Look at the trees. It's so wonderful over there. You can look at it from a distance. You can talk about it all you want. But until, listen, until you've stepped out and acted upon the Word of God by faith, you will never experience it. Are you listening to me today? Or am I just talking to myself? Are you listening to this Word? You've got to take it. You've got to believe. You've got to step out. You've got to pack it up and say, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go. I'm not even speaking of a physical sense. I'm talking about a spiritual sense. I'm willing to go on with you, God. I'm willing to go further. I'm willing to go deeper. I'm willing you to take me to places I've never been before. To experience things in my life I've never known before. I can hear about it, but I've got to experience it in my own life. God says, I, I've got a plan. I've got a future for Word of Life Christian Center. But we've gotten too comfortable in the nest. We like holding on to the security blanket. We like holding on to the job. We like holding on to the income. We like holding on to those things which we think support us or provide for us. You know, God can speak a job just like that. He showed me that. Boop, there it is. He's my provider. God can bring healing. God can bring deliverance. God can lead you into places you've never been before spiritually. He can show you the, the depths of His Word. He can speak to you in the most inner part of your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Revelation. Inspiration. God can come upon you and take you to places you've never been before. 
But it's going to cost. It's going to take a commitment. It's going to take a sacrifice. It's going to take believing. It's going to take willingness to step out and go forward. But I, I'm comfortable in this. I'm, I'm satisfied where I am. Abraham could have stayed in Haran. He could have stayed in Ur. He could have, when he left out of Ur and went to Haran, he, he could have stayed there and said, you know, I think I'll, I'll set camp up here. I think I'll buy me a house. I think I'll lay me a foundation of my own. I kind of like it here. God says, no. Abraham, I've got more for you. Well, I thought this was it. Oh, no, Abraham. This is just the beginning. Well, what do you mean? I'm saved. I'm set free. You've spoken to me. I I thought everything is fine. Everything's wonderful. God says everything is wonderful. But there's more for you. There's a land out there. There's a promise. I've given it to you. But it has not yet been fulfilled. And God says, i got more for you. I want to bless you. I want to pour my Spirit upon you. I want to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. I want to use you as the gifts of the Spirit work evidently and through your life. I want you to pray for others. I want you to be a light in a dark world. I want you to be a witness. I want you to be salt in a saltless society. I've got more for you, church. I've got children out there that are lost. I've got families that don't know God. I've got a a city that's steeped in religious stupor. There's a form of God in this, but now the power of who I am. I got more. You can look at it all you want. You can sing the songs. You can have the worship. But until it becomes a reality to you, you haven't attained it yet. There's so much that God has for us. Many Christians could be living a victorious, I'm talking victorious, spirit-filled life if only they would take hold of that which God has for them. I I speak to myself. It's the same for me. God has so much. If you're willing to release yourself from your comfort zone, if you're willing to release yourself from what you think God is supposed to be in your life, and that was a good message, but we have our own ideals of what we think how God's going to use us or how God is supposed to work in our life. And so we almost box God in, if you will, and said, I'm only willing to do this. I'm willing to be a part of this. I'm willing to, 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 to step over there, but I'm not willing to do any more. And we restrain the Holy Spirit because we have in our own mind a, a thought of what we think God ought to be in us. And God says, no, no, I've got more than that. You, you've got to release that. You've got to put that behind you. I, <laughs> And there's so much and deeper things of the Spirit. We, we get in a religious rut, if you will. And we go through our routine and think that's all that God is. And God said, oh, if you only knew, there's so much more that I am. He says to Moses, I am that I am. I'm everything. I'm the all-self-existent one. I'm everything. If you'll only allow me, if you'll only step out, if you'll only commit, if you'll only believe, if you'll only move forward... If you'll only take the journey of faith. But that's a hard commitment. Because in that journey of faith, there may not be some padded pews. There might not be the cozy homes that we have or the secure jobs. No, we need to quit talking about Canaan. And we need to get up and go there. Now, most of us are not commanded to pull up stakes and go to a strange country. But the challenge of our faith is just as real. Now, whenever Abraham went into the land of Canaan, he was marked by his tent and his altar. Now, look at verse 8, chapter 12 of Genesis. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel in the west and A on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called in the name of the Lord. And this is a part of the journey, folks. You've got to have an altar. Now, what's so significant about the tent and the altar? Well, the tent marked him as a stranger and a pilgrim who didn't belong to this world. And the altar marked Abraham as a citizen of heaven. You see, he gave witness to all that he had separated from this world. In other words, that is, that is the, the tent. And he, vo- he devoted himself completely to the Lord, and that would be the altar. And whenever Abraham abandoned his tent or abandoned his altar, he got himself into trouble. Notice that. 
But he came back, and you'll find that when he did come back, after he repented, he, re- he built an altar again. He goes down to Egypt. God didn't tell him to go to Egypt, but circumstances got difficult. It got dry. It got hard. And so the first thing that we do in response to that is to leave. We move. You say, it's got to be the church. <laughs> it's got to be the land of Canaan. It's got to be... It's got to be with God. There's something wrong here. The promise is not working out like I thought it should work out. Things are not going the way I thought they would. It's not as smooth as I thought it should be. It's not as easy as I thought it was supposed to be. Ministry is supposed to be fun. It's not fun anymore. It was fun when I got into it. I was all for it. Ha ha. Yeah, this is great. Well, now it's hard. Now there's more commitment. Now there's more sacrifices. It's not as easy. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go down to Egypt. God never said to go. But see, it's easier down in Egypt. You see, that church over there doesn't ask me, it doesn't challenge me to be committed, you see. I don't feel conviction over there. I can go over there and sit in there and not be noticed by anybody and just go get me a cozy little word. And nothing is asked of me. I don't have to do anything there. I can just go to Egypt. But understand (laughs) that there's nothing there in Egypt for you. What may feel God or cozy in the flesh is destroying you in the spirit. It's killing you in the spirit. Now, folks, we, whenever we get too attached to this world is when we find ourselves in trouble. Lot sold his tent and set up homestead in Sodom. He compromised his conviction, lost his wife, and his two daughters committed immoral acts of sin with their father. Now listen, don't let anything pull you out of the altar. Because whatever you allow to you to pull you out of the altar eventually is going to pull you out of heaven. The world is not our home. We're pilgrims or strangers in this world. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. This world doesn't have anything for you. God called you out of the world of darkness to live in the light of God's dear Son. Hebrews 11 and 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They're on this earth, but they're not of this place. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out of, they would have had opportunity to return. But now, what do they do? They desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. The Bible says that Abraham pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. What does that mean? Bethel means this, the house of God. Ai means this, ruin. Now, figuratively speaking, Abraham and Sarah were walking in the light from east to west, if you you will, from Ai to Bethel, from the city of ruin to the house of God. That's the direction they're going. But now the church has reversed. It's no longer walking from east to west, but from west to east. It's no longer walking toward Bethel. But now it's going back and it has its eyes on Ai. You see, the city of ruin. What am I saying? This worldly system is in ruins. But the true believers... Amen. Have turned their back on this world to set their faces toward God's heavenly home. Proverbs 4 and 18 says this, But the path of the just is like the shining sun. That's it. That shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Walking towards Bethel gets sweeter all the time. Walking with Jesus gets sweeter every day, folks. That's what it means. I'm not walking toward Ai anymore. I'm walking away from Ai. Ai, I've got my back turned on that city. I've got my heart and my eyes set on Bethel, the house of God. Everything is God. I'm going to walk in that direction that God has for me. I'm not going back. I'm not going to AI. You understand? But through the years, Satan has done this slowly and deceptively. We have, we have compromised and we're turning this thing around so we're not heading towards Bethel anymore. But now we're heading back to AI. So I know that faith brings us out. Faith brings us in. And third and lastly today, faith brings us on. You see, Genesis 12 and 9. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now notice the verb that describes Abram's life. The Bible says Abram journeyed. We see that. Verse 9. And Genesis 12 and 4, it says he departed. 
In Genesis 12 and 5, it says he went forth. In verse 6, it says he passed through. In verse 8, he removed. In verse 9, he journeyed. God had Abraham on the move. Abraham continually met new challenges. And in that was challenged to trust God. When he met that challenge, when he was faced with that challenge, in that challenge in itself, he was challenged to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ or in God. Knowing that God has the grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4 and 16. Now folks, listen to me. God is not interested in our comfortable Christianity. If He's interested in your comfort, He did never send His Son, Jesus, to die on a bloody cross and suffer the way that He suffered to die for the sins of humanity. He's not interested in our comfort. Amen. It's always easy to stay in our comfort zone. It'd be easy to stay in Ur. But easy easy has nothing nothing to do with it, folks. God hasn't called us to, be, to nothingness. No, sir. He's called each one of us to trust Him and to walk by faith. He called the church to walk the journey of faith. It's not always easy. There are difficult trials. There are hard circumstances in that journey. There are going to be times when we face giants and storms, struggles, mountains that look impossible to cross, and without God they are impossible. But God said this to us in His Word. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And then the Bible says... Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Amen. It's going to take people like you and I here today that have the faith to trust God even when it looks absolutely impossible. I see a mountain above me, before me. There's no way. God says, that's right. In your own strength, in your own might and power, in your own thinking, in your own trying to figure out how to do things, God says, listen, the answer is not in yourself. It's not in your self-help books. It's not in your psychology. It's not even your own human thinking or rationalizing. No, no. This thing is me and me alone. Amen. You've got to trust me. I'm the only one that can bring that thing down. I can make it as a plane that you can walk across that. Amen. And it won't have victory over you, but you'll have victory over it if you'll trust me by faith and believe my word and make it your own. That's the only way to be delivered from drugs. That's the only way to be delivered from sin. That's the only way to be delivered from alcohol. That's the only way to be delivered from immorality. It's the only way to be delivered. It's not by your might. It's not by your strength. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. No, there's no way that this can be done by human effort or strength. It's going to take an act of God. It's only going to be by His Spirit. Now listen. My friend, that's, that's the most difficult place to be in. I want you to understand this. It's the most difficult place to be in, and yet it's the best place. Because it's grueling to the flesh. Because the flesh wants to do something. The flesh wants to act. The most difficult thing for you to be in, in the Spirit, is when you're at a situation when your flesh can't do anything. It cannot do anything. You understand, it's grueling to the flesh because it causes your faith to be in a place to where it's going to have to trust God. You can't make it work. Selling cakes isn't going to answer this. You understand, it's not going to do it for you. Now, it's there. It's either God or it's over. If God doesn't move, there won't be an Israelite alive the next morning. If God doesn't move, the widow woman and her son starve to death. If God doesn't move, Lazarus stays in the tomb. Understand what I'm saying. What is this? It's Daniel in the lion's den. You understand? The door shut. There's nobody else can help you. You're going to be a meal for these lions if God doesn't move tonight. And in the natural, there's no reasoning that those lions should not have destroyed Daniel. But God met him there in that place. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace. It's when your back is against the wall. It, it causes you to be in a place to where you have to trust God. We don't, we don't really want that these days. We want, we want easy life. We want a preacher that promises all the good things. See, we don't want that prophet to tell us something that's not good. <laughs> we, we don't want to talk about 
hardships and difficulties. See, God wants to take you on a journey with Him. It's a journey of faith. It's not something that can be forced upon you, but it's a journey that we must be willing to yield ourselves to absolute obedience to God. You understand? I'm not going to mislead anyone here this morning. There are tests and trials in this journey. It's not the easy way. There are hard places. There are difficult places. A place of refining. A place where God reveals deep spiritual truths. It's a place where death comes to self. You understand? It's a place where, where He shows you what you are. And then it's a place where He shows you what He is. You see? <laughs> a journey of faith. It, it's a place of, that if you're willing to take the journey, will change you from glory to glory. That you'll never be the same. God will mold you and fashion you. Your faith will be tried by fire and will come pour, forth more precious than gold. It's not easy. But if you're willing to trust God, if you're willing to do that, He'll guide you, strengthen you, pour His Spirit upon you. With God, this journey is possible. It's possible. But let me ask you today. Are you, are you personally willing to take this journey? Are you willing to put your life fully in the trust of Jesus Christ? Are you willing to surrender everything to Him and say, Lord, I don't know what's ahead. I don't know what you're going to lead me to, but I'm willing to go. If you'll help me, I'm a willing vessel. Take me in this journey of faith. Oh, hallelujah. God may reveal to you Himself in a way that you've never known Him before. He'll show you things. He'll, he may use you for, for things that you'd never imagined that you'd be used in. He might use this church this church in a way that you could have never thought of. I, I, I mean, you never know what God might do with this local body of Christ. But we can't be satisfied sitting right here. We can't be satisfied with just what we have. We've got to be willing to be stretched. We've got to be willing to be used. We've got to be willing to step out and take the journey of faith that God has for us. Trusting Him. Is it easy? No. Is it grueling? Yes. Is it rewarding? Oh, you better believe it. It is rewarding. Can we stand together, please? Hallelujah. Are oh, you willing? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can we just worship Him now? Hallelujah. Where you are, just say, God... Work that word in my heart. God, have your way in me. Have your way in me, oh God. Right now, Lord. Hallelujah, oh God. I want to be willing to take that journey of faith. I want to be willing, oh God. Wherever you lead me, whatever you ask me, whatever you want of me, God, I'm willing to do. I'm willing to go. Oh, hallelujah. God, I'm willing to be what you want. I'm willing to take that journey of faith. I'm willing, God. I'm willing. I'm willing to lay it all down for you. I'm willing, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just begin to worship God where you are. Begin to worship God where you are. Hallelujah. Brian, if you just begin to play, please, and just worship God where you are. I, I don't want this to be just a quick surface decision, but I want this to be in your heart. You've got to determine what kind of life you're going to live is it going to be your life? Is it going to be His life? It seems that we try to share that life. Well, we'll let God have a certain portion of it. But I've, I've got to be in control of the other part. I'm willing to give God 30%. I'm willing to give God 40%. But that other part belongs to me. I believe today that God is saying, Listen, if you want to take that journey that I have for you, that journey of faith, I must have 100% of you. You're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to know that I'm able. I can meet every need. Hallelujah. I can bring you into a, a land 
I can bring you into a spiritual land. I can show you. I can reveal to you. I can bless you. I can use you. I can do great things in and through your life if you be willing. Maybe some of you, you're looking at a mountain. So there's no way that this can happen. It's going to have to be God. And maybe that's where you're at. Your back is up against the wall. You're in the lion's den. And you, you're in a situation, a position that you're going to have to trust God. But my question to you today is, are you willing to take the journey of faith? Are you willing? Hallelujah. I'm going to open these altars. God's speaking to your heart. This altar is open for you. This altar is open for you today. Hallelujah. Let's come gather around and believe God right now. Believe Him right now. A journey of faith. It may not be easy. Be some difficult places. But God will be with you. The Lord will lead you. He'll speak to you. He'll show you. He'll guide you. It's a journey. It's a journey between you and God. It's a journey. And it's a journey of faith. Hallelujah. Maybe you're here this morning. and You want to give your heart to Christ. You want to get saved. You want to make a commitment to the Lord. I invite you to come forward. I invite you to come and pray with you this morning. You want to give your heart to Christ. Whatever it might be, let the Lord have His way. Hallelujah. Some others can help me pray this morning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I wait upon you. That's it. Wait upon Him today. Holy Spirit, come and breathe in me. Speak to me, God. And take my life, make it new. Oh, make it new. To be more of you and less of me. Hallelujah. I need you, Lord, breathe in me, shine your light and set me free, stir my faith, revive my soul, touch my heart and make me whole, Lord, breathe in me. Lord, I cry out to you. Holy Spirit, come and reign in me. And change my heart, make it true. Lord, guide my life, have your way in me. I need you, Lord, breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith, revive my soul, and touch my heart and make me whole. I need you, Lord, breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith. Revive my soul and touch my heart and make me whole. Lord, breathe in me. Breathe in me. Lord, search me. Lord, change me. Breathe in me with your life. Lord, take me. Lord, use me. Lord, be glorified. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith, revive my soul, 
Touch my heart and make me whole. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith. Revive my soul. Touch my heart and make me whole. Lord, breathe in me. Breathe in me. Lord, breathe in me. Breathe in me. Lord, I wait upon you. Holy Spirit, come and breathe in me. Take my life, make it new. To be more of you and less of me. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light. Set me free. There it is, church. Stir Begin to praise faith. the Lord. Worship Revive Him this morning. Have your way, O oh God. Draw Touch us deeper. Take us further faith. in this journey of faith. Take us further, oh, God. Take us further in this journey. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Breathe in me. I give my life and my soul to you. Lord, I, I give my all to you. you. God, take me in this journey. Lead Holy me in this Spirit journey. God, Hallelujah. Change my heart, make it true. Lord, guide my life. Have your way in me. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith. Revive my soul. Touch my heart and make me whole. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith. Revive my soul. Touch my heart and make me whole. Lord, search me. Lord, use me. Breathe in me with your light. Lord, take me. Lord, change me. Lord, be glorified. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith, revive my soul, touch my heart and make me whole. I need you, Lord, breathe in me, shine your light, set me free. Stir my faith, revive my soul. Touch my heart and make me whole. Lord, breathe in me. Breathe in me. Lord, breathe in me. Breathe in me. Lord, breathe in me. Search me, Lord, change me, breathe in me.
with your life. Lord, take me. Lord, use me. Lord, be glorified. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith. Revive my soul. Touch my heart and make me whole. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith. Revive my soul. Touch my heart and make me whole. Breathe in me. Lord, breathe in me. Breathe in me. Lord, breathe in me. Breathe in me. Touch my heart and make me whole. I need you, Lord. Breathe in me. Shine your light and set me free. Stir my faith. Revive my soul. Touch my heart and make me whole. 